All right, then. Um, I am Kevin. I work with the University Technology Office uh, in the Information Security Department. And uh, remember to use our hashtag uh, Digital Trust Summit on LinkedIn and your uh, various media accounts. Uh, without further ado, I will be introducing uh, Curtis Ray. He'll be presenting on people-centric security, a better way to implement. Alrighty, thanks, Kevin. Appreciate the, the lead in there. Um, yes, I'm uh, Curtis Ray. I'm with Proofpoint, and uh, we've been advocating a, um, a bit of a better approach to how to tackle all these security issues that have been uh, that have been going on. And um, to that end, there's a, a couple of things. Uh, I'll give myself a little bit of background just so you know where I'm coming from. And then uh, go into, um, you know, go right into, you know, into the story here. So um, really what I want to do to kind of frame up this conversation is talk a little bit about, um, you know, some of the day in the life things that I've seen uh, over the years, uh, and then go into this more of a people centric approach and what the, what those benefits are. And, uh, the reason why uh, I'm a little passionate about, about this idea is that um, over the last um, you know, 20, 25 years or so, I've spent a lot of time actually in security, um, either on the security front lines themselves in some of these uh, larger organizations or uh, selling to them, uh, not just with Proofpoint, but as a, a value added reseller that focused on uh, best of breed security tools. So uh, a little bit of quick math, puts me right around uh, doing this at, you know, um, kind of uh, the Y2K timeframe. And back then there wasn't really uh, even a conceptualization of a security incident response team. There barely was a thing as a security operations center. Uh, the term SOC wasn't really used back then. It was really just a group of people um, that uh, were typically fairly older in age, um, they had been around a lot uh, in any organization, and some guys focused in on uh, networking things, some guys focused in on desktop stuff, some people answered the phones, and it was really trying to figure out uh, how to make sense of all the craziness that's going on, and, um, and then really get all those to, to work together. And so uh, back at the Y2K time, uh, the, the hue and cry was, I need more visibility. I don't know what's going on. I need better tools. Uh, I feel like I'm at a disadvantage. Uh, fast forward to where we are today. Uh, I don't know anyone that's begging for more tools. Uh, no more dashboards. Uh, what, what, what can I do to make sense of all this stuff? I don't have enough time. There's too much information, too many things to dig in. And so that's why I wanted to start with um, really uh, kind of a tale of two stories. These stories uh, are, are endemic on just about every customer that I've ever talked to. Uh, again, not just over the 10 years of Proofpoint that I've been here, but also just as a security practitioner. And so, um, you know, the first story, you know, like let's start with just a, a security team, a, a typical day in the life. And so um, at that level, then, um, you know, basically they get an alert, right? No, nothing spectacular about that. It happens all the time. There's a suspicious login alert. And so uh, a CASB tool uh, that's looking up, you know, tied into Office 365, Google Suite, right? Either, you know, in a separate one or one that, uh, you know, just the native ones says there's a suspicious uh, login on this account. But, um, you know, like after it flags it initially and this account logs in multiple times a day, sometimes from one IP address or from another, the end users, typically are using a VPN or they're using a cell phone provider or something else that shifts those IP addresses, but it, it creates all these alerts. And so it's hard to figure out what these alerts really mean and what should be done about it, right? So the suspicious login really goes into uh, alert fatigue immediately, right? Is this something I really care about? Is it not? Uh, how can I really tell? And so when they dig into it a little bit, um, the analyst has a little bit more familiarity with it and um, knowing that email is the number one threat vector suspects that, um, you know, like a, an account may have gotten compromised via an email. 
But when they look at the um, at the logs, they try to go to the email filtering solution, then it, it, it's hard to figure it out because it made it past the defenses. Uh, they haven't quarantined that email because it doesn't have a malicious URL in it. It doesn't have bad reputation, right? Uh, there's no attachment that's on there that's been quarantined. It made it past. So they don't really have a lot of visibility uh, on, that, on that issue. Uh, furthermore, as it goes on, then um, we don't know if it's an imposter attack or not, but um, we're hoping that the endpoint might be able to tell us a little bit about it. But the, um, you know, the endpoint doesn't have a whole lot of information. It, it's not the, you know, the antivirus, the EDR, if you will, is not oriented on scanning email. It's looking at desktop stuff. So, um, you know, what applications have been run, what's running in the background, those types of things. So uh, it doesn't really have a whole lot of you know, integration, certainly not on an email side of the house. And so really what they're hoping for is that, um, you know what, like maybe all of this stuff dumping into their SIM tool, um, might, there might be some correlation there. And they're digging into that, right? You know, that's what you do. It's day in and day out. But it's difficult to, to really figure things out, right? That takes time, a lot of it. And success really only comes in digging through a SIM if you have the right filter set up ahead of time and they're used in the right way. And the person who is looking at it has experience to understand what, that, uh, what those arcane log files are actually saying. And if there's a gap, something's not working, hopefully they have enough experience to realize that it's it's not a complete picture, right? And and that's that's the best case scenario times every alert, times every person, times every day, right? In the meantime, uh, the, there's a compliance team that's really focused on some of the, the compliance issues that every organization has, whether it's public sector and it's a school, whether it's a finance uh, institution or a hospital, right? There are things that uh, about students, about alumni, about finances that just shouldn't really be exposed and would cause damage if that happened. So there's a compliance team and that in, in compliance team actually has an alert on their dashboard that says, hey, there might be some sort of threat here, an insider threat. And what happens is that there's some unusual file activity that's going on in the OneDrive account. And there's a person that doesn't really interact with these particular files before, but now all of a sudden they're doing a bunch of things and they're trying to figure out what is going on on that. Um, maybe it's a case of excessive permissions. Um, you know, there, there's a lot of transition that happens, um, you know, in an educational environment, there's, you know, student interns, workers, all that stuff that kind of come in and come out at, on the enterprise level. People, um, you know, quit shift roles every day. So there might be some unintended inheritance where they were allowed access to that at one point, but it's really hard to tell because they don't have that direct integration into a PAM solution that monitors that on a day in and day basis. They have one, but there's multiple sources of authority about what they should or shouldn't do. They're not really uh, tied directly into the structure of the personnel. So they don't really understand that. And when they really look down to it, right, when you get the brass tacks, what happened was that there was a DLP alert that triggered this off, right? And so a DLP alert is one of those things that are very, very noisy. There is a lot of time that takes, um, that takes to determine between false positives and true positives from events. And so you sort through all of those because if you look for social security numbers or credit card numbers or bank routing numbers, there's a lot of false positives there. But even if you find one, um, and you see it, this alert that triggered all this stuff was actually a legitimate one and we should be investigating it. The problem is uh, at the endpoint, it's very, very difficult to push a DLP policy, a data leakage uh, prevention policy to the endpoint. And so there is an endpoint that has multi, you know, multifaceted types of thing. It looks at AV and it looks at a DLP and it looks at access rights. But there's no enforcement on it because it's really problematic to get that enforced at the endpoint. And it might be your own device. It might be a BYOD type of thing. So they can't actually stop it. All they did was just recognize that something flew past that wire. So at the end of the day, the compliance team doesn't have any context about this. They're looking at a file, an alert that was 
kicked off by that. They don't know who the person is. They don't know if they should or shouldn't be interacting with it. And they certainly don't know what that person's daily operations are. You know, do they normally traffic in this? What have they done before this? What are they doing after this alert? All they have is this alert to go off of, right? Seems pretty, pretty common in my experience uh, for compliance teams and people chasing down DLP alerts, right? They certainly can't predict what's going to happen next if another alert even occurs or not and if it's related. So what's actually happened, right? This happens all the time. And it's, it's really, it is an attacker. Uh, an attacker did come in. They reached out to an end user and they sent a lure to them via email. So the first team was absolutely right. Uh, happens all day, right? This is the most common attack vector. But that email didn't have a URL in it that was had a bad reputation. It didn't have an executable, right? Um, and so they actually divulged the, um, they tricked that end user into divulging the account. And now that account is compromised. So as this stuff kind of went through, they've been you know, picking at your people, right? Sending something until something works. And then now that they have that account, they own that account. And so now the attacker is starting to figure out what that person has access to. So the attacker has, has focused on your people. They are now expanding the reach into your organization by focusing on what that person has access to and what that person does on a daily basis and who else they interact with, right? And then this is something that's very, very common, particularly in educational institutions is I call it kind of an EDU on EDU uh, crime, where one compromised account inside an institution ends up spamming out everywhere else. So the attacker is focused on the person and this is completely different than the attacker trying to run um, you know, queries against what browser that end user is using, or trying to run code to exploit it on the endpoint, right? They're focused on the people. So the challenge is that when tools don't work together, it's it's just really a big burden on, on security teams, right? And I'm probably preaching to the choir if you guys were interested enough to come in here, this is a day in your life, right? You've got suspicious logins that come in, you've got insider threat compliance things that, that are going on. And really having these multiple teams pursue um, you know, pursue these alerts and these actions in their own lanes is effective, but it's it's not as effective as it could be. It's the same, they need to be able to work together. They need to be able to communicate with each other and they have different tools that don't intersect. And so it's hard to have them interact with each other uh, on their, in their own uh, lanes. And so that time, the time that's meant, that gets spent on that could be better spent, right? Um, the compromised account that the security team is investigating is the same user with excessive folder permissions that was trying to exfil, you know, exfiltrate that data. And so the attacker is focusing on the people. The security teams are focusing on the infrastructure. And this asymmetrical imbalance really only works in favor of you, the defenders, if your organization spends a tremendous amount of money and resources to operate those technologies. Meanwhile, on the attacker side, they're looking at LinkedIn. The LinkedIn is the best penetration tool on the market today. Uh, people volunteer all the details that they, you know, they talk about, right? It's, it's, hey, I just learned about this new technology. Hey, we're just deploying this out and I just got certified. Uh, here's the new things that I'm thinking about, right? All of these things, very, very valid. Attackers just sit back, let your people tell them what's interesting. Let, let your people tell them what's going on in your organization. And they just watch them do the daily work and then just surgically be precise and reach out to the, to the people. So the security teams, what we've been advocating is that there needs to be a better approach. You need to understand what the entire tale is rather than a bunch of independent stories. And so with that, that technology uh, and that approach needs to start with people at the top and have an integrated uh, communication path with these, other, with these other technologies and not just rely on Perl scripts and log parsing to kind of bring some stuff over and then just throw it into a giant repository where people may dig through and find treasure, right? So, so this is what we call the people-centric approach. 
And in, a, in essence, right, what we're advocating is kind of flip these two stories on its head and start with people, don't end with people. And when you think about it from a people-centric perspective, there's three common uh, perspectives that is most helpful to uh, analyze a person on. You wanna understand what attacks they're being subjected to. Uh, you wanna know how sophisticated they are, you know, the quantity of these things are, right? Every attack is a little bit different. They, they have different risks. You also wanna understand who is likely to fall for those attacks. Um, are they going to click on the malicious content if it gets sent their way because it's made it past the perimeter? Does it, um, do these people not participate in security awareness training or if they get tested, do they fail? Um, it's similar, right? Like the, the fish sims, do they get you know, successfully duped on those? Or maybe they're using your cloud services, uh, Google Office 365 or their own email address in, in ways that are concerning, right? They, they send their email address all over God's green earth and um, they've just used it forever because it's the email address they remember and the password they use for you is the password that they remember. So it's all the same, right? Um, what's the likelihood of those threats actually working? And understanding who that person is and the business privilege that they have when they operate is also, asked, is also key as well. So who can access these critical systems and who can access the sensitive data, or um, if they get popped, right, their account gets popped, who has the most um, horizontal access, right, for lateral movement as, as it goes across. So really, in essence, it's, it's easy to think of it more as like the probability of who's getting these attacks based on the attacks that have been coming in, right? Um, what's the likelihood of those attacks actually succeeding? And then finally, what would be the business impact if that account gets compromised because of what they have access to. So with that idea, right, um, vulnerability, really uh, attack and privilege, those three intersecting ideas pose a very interesting way to carve up this apple when you're looking at your entirety, you know, your entire organization. Many organizations are more than 10 people, right? Like you can't focus on 100% of the people 100% of the time. So how do, you, how do you kind of get your arms around this? And so if you take the idea of being very attacked and then you intersect it with people who are very vulnerable, well, now you've got a small subset of group that you could call them soft targets, if you will, right? These highly weaponized uh, attacks have a better likelihood to succeed with this subset of people versus your entire organization, right? That's a group that you probably wanna pay attention to. Likewise, if these very attacked uh, people that are in your organization, well, they happen to have a lot of business privilege, right? Uh, they're VPs, they're a member of finance, they are account payable, they're in HR, any of those things. Well, if those accounts get compromised, uh, it's not them having a bad day, your organization is gonna have a bad day, right? You're gonna be in the papers, all sorts of stuff's gonna happen. So we call those major targets, right? Those are major focuses uh, and, and typically, they're high profile ones uh, in the security team already, right? Uh, they're already in there. But the people that don't get a lot of the attacks from the attackers, but still have uh, a fair amount of business privilege, and data shows that, you know what, they're clickers. They don't get a lot of them, thank God. But you know what, they're, when it comes by, man, you know, they're going to get hooked. Oh, and by the way, they don't really participate in that security awareness stuff because, man, that's a pain. Um, they don't believe in it. It's a pain, whatever that is. Well, those are latent targets. Those are the guys and gals that typically are off the radar for your security teams because nothing's really hitting them. They're not really tripping a bunch of alarm bells. You're not talking to them that much. But in the kind of the grand scheme of things, when uh, someone asks you, oh, well, where's the next you know, compromise breach going to come from in our organization? Well, you know, you're already focusing on these major folks and you're already focusing on the people that get all these attacks, but it's these kind of latent killers that, if, you know, one thing slips by and it hits those guys, those suckers, well, that's going to be bad for everybody. The intersection of all these ideas, by the way, we, we just call them intimate targets. And those would be a great place to start any common trending that you would want to do where you're looking for, um, you know, how can I do least amount of effort? best amount of impact on reducing potential risk, we call those the imminent targets. 
So going forward, if you have this paradigm, right? If you can take in this example that I had, uh, you know, we had like 20,000 people and we said only the most attack people, only the most vulnerable people, and only the most people that, that are sorry, the only the people who have the most privilege. That intersects, right? That allows you to focus on a group. Well, if you can take all those aspects, well, now you can sort by that, right? You can sort by your priorities and you can figure out how you want to go down based on these breakdowns. Because someone who gets a lot of attacks, someone who is very, very highly attacked, well, if they don't have access to any sensitive information, um, or the data has shown, you know what, they actually believe in security awareness training, and they've never been duped in all the efforts that you've done. Those guys are rock solid. Well, I, you know, we kind of advocate that there's not a lot of potential business risk, risk that's there. Every account that gets compromised is bad, don't get me wrong. But in an order of operations, someone who's like that, even though they're highly attacked, we would advocate maybe bring them down a little bit, deprioritize de the order and how you get to them, right? Because there's going to be someone else who um, maybe doesn't get attacked a lot, but is a sucker for everything that gets put in front of them. And oh my God, they have access to the account payable and they are responsible for hundreds of thousands of dollars in our organization's pay payroll. We need to make sure that that person has the right priorities or whatever that is, right? You sort based on what is important for you, not just on the number of alerts that are stacked up in your queue based on a, a ticketing infrastructure. And so when you start taking that look, it's very, very helpful to understand the people and why they are risking. And every organization I've talked to has different priorities on that. Some things they really, really highly value, other things they don't really care that much. But if you have an, if you have kind of a, an easy view on common things, then you'll start to understand why some people are bubbling up to that top of that list. So if someone's always clicking on everything that gets sent their way, um, you know, you would want to know that, right? Um, you would want to know that malicious stuff, if it makes it through, they're going to fall for it. And by the way, if you sent something to them just to train them and they didn't participate in it, you would want to know that. If they use their email addresses everywhere else and then, you know, those passwords with it also got uh, compromised in a breach you would want to know that, right? So you have an idea that there's, there's some things that are kind of a bit more damaging um, than others, uh, things that are more concerning to an organization than others, right? Um, and so you can, you, you can spend a little bit of effort on setting up what your priorities are. But if you understand what a person's coming from and the behaviors that they're likely to do, then you have a much more educated guess on the likelihood of what you're investigating would actually be something that you need to be worried about. And if you kind of take that to the next level, right? Um, level up in a hierarchy or an organization, it becomes very, very uh, helpful for security leaders and strategists to be able to talk about the trends that are happening on inside your organization. Um, I've spent, again, 20 years and uh, it, selling these things, implementing these things. And uh, I think the one sin that most security organizations had in the past is that they would talk about reports and the reports would be, hey, we've had this number of alerts and now it's down here, but now it's up to here. Or I've had this many tickets that I need to do, or here's this data factoid and here's that data factoid. And it's great for us technologists because we get it. We understand what's going on. But security is a service that protects the entire organization. And critical leaders and people responsible for budgets and for uh, financing and personnel, they're not as technically fluent as, as we are. So being able to relate that to potential business risks of people is a different conversation. Telling someone, hey, you know, your group is uh, on a scale of one to 10 for potential business risk or organization, they're at an 8.5, but everybody else, we're down here in the fives and the fours. But here's some vulnerabilities. Here's some things your people are doing that brings that risk all the way up. Can we talk about this? Can we figure out ways to bring that down, right? That's an impactful, meaningful, valuable conversation to a board member, to a CIO, to a business leader. And they don't have to be concerned with PCAPs or measures of you know, sophistication and vulnerabilities that had this and that and that, right? It's a different communication about a very complex system, 
that is actually really beneficial. So, so what do you do with this? Like, what, what do you gain if you take this perspective and kind of flip the traditional model on its head and start with people, right? Like what's, what's the benefit of doing this? I've gone through some examples, but what we find is the best way to go forward on this, there's actually three benefits um, to each of the layers in a security organization from what we've seen. So starting foundationally at the security analyst layer, um, I don't know that there's really a, a, a big need to, to take the people-centric you know, security model and only do this and then throw everything else out and only just look at the people risk, right? No one's going to do that, frankly. And we're not advocating that, you know, you get rid of firewalls or endpoint and all that type of stuff. But the analyst overworked, overwhelmed. There's too much stuff that's going on. But if you were able to just take a pause and either take whatever dashboard or ticketing system that you have and say, hey, this is the alert, this is the IP address, this is the MAC address, this is whatever it is, and it's associated to Bob. And Bob, by the way, has an attack index of blah, has a business risk index of blah, and has these vulnerabilities set up, or an overall risk is whatever. That helps that analyst actually figure out who they should spend most of the time on, right? Who do they get when they're sipping coffee because they just started their day? Who do they wait until after lunch to get, right? Everybody's important, every alert's important, but there are some that are more important than others, right? That's just kind of the way it is. And from a, a management perspective, understanding that you could have a more sophisticated runbook that says, hey, in spite of the fact that there may be 1500 alerts in, in systems X, Y, and Z, if you find something that is prioritized where the business risk is you know, 8.5, you hit those first or it has these vulnerabilities or they have this type of potential um, you know, business um, privilege. Now you've got a, a, a run book that is a little bit more solid and you can sleep a little bit better at night. At the, at the risk officer layer, it, it goes to about, um, you know, like at security director and risk officer layers, what I found is very common is there is every intention of following every best practice in security. I've never met anyone that says, nah, multi-factor off, forget that stuff. That, that, that means nothing. Well, I mean, salespeople will probably sell against it, but <laughs> actual security directors, like they, they love that stuff. So it, it's never a challenge about really saying, hey, you should do other things. They're, they are tasked with balancing the best practices against business impact and business culture. And so having a data-based conversation that says, okay, um, as an example, uh, maybe doing web isolation for very risky people because they either click on everything a lot or they are in charge of the keys of the kingdom. But it's only these 123 people. That's it. We're not going to roll this out to everyone. We're not going to have to create this giant run book and have to have communications that are specific to the 20,000 students plus the 15,000 administrators. And oh, by the way, here's all these faculty and staff over here. And then here's all this other stuff, right? Just a small group. But look, look what happens if we have it just on this focus group. It brings the risk down significantly for our entire organization. And we can do this over a little bit of time. We can do this forever. We can have that kind of conversation, right? You're now bringing data to that emotional knife fight that has stymied you from rolling out every best practice that you've ever wanted to on every technology that you bought and that you're frustrated because the CISO is saying, hey, I'm getting hit by X, Y, and Z. And speaking of that CISO, the CISO is always tasked with saying the, the, the strategy, right? You've got to have that strategy as you go across. And you also need to be able to communicate success and failure against that strategy and where the trends are happening internally as well along with your peer groups. And so from the peer group perspective, from the, um, the trending perspective, and I've already touched on this, right, with the, others, with the other graphic there, being able to speak about trends that are happening to your people, that is a much better conversation. And better conversations, frankly, mean an easier job. And people will get it. It'd be easier to secure the budget. It'll be easier to justify the, you know, the, um, uh, the investments that you had, either in technology or people. And being able to say, hey, we've done X, Y, and Z that are common against this greatest group of potential business risk. And so therefore we've brought this down. Well, that's a message of success that every CISO and every security leader 
wants to be able to achieve and communicate even with non-technical folks. So there's, there's a, a lot of different aspects um, you know, to, to doing a people-centric approach, but there's a lot of benefits to it. And it's not necessarily, again, you know, kind of in, in summary, it, it's not throwing out the baby with the bathwater and saying, you don't need to do what you're doing today. But what it's saying is at the first moment, the second you can deduce who the person is that is behind these alerts, whatever the reason that is, if you take a different approach and actually have a system that gives you that context as a foundation to start upon, as opposed to a destination that you end up in, there's a lot of slack in between that, 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 that space that is ripe for compression uh, if you're an analyst. It's ripe for uh, trending analysis if you're a director, and it's ripe for being able to, to advocate changes in how you proceed and adjust those risks at the leadership level. So um, that's pretty much it um, as far as the, the, the people-centric approach. I did want to leave just a little bit of extra time if people had any questions or, or input on this. Um, I'm familiar with this approach and I've been do doing this for about four years now. And I've got a lot of other background as well, if you want to have any type of dialogue or conversations about it. Um, otherwise, we've got a little bit of spare time that you might be able to do a bio break before you uh, hop on to the next session.
Yep. Thank, Thank you, you for that, much. Curtis. That was a wonderful presentation. Uh, your insight on uh, threat vectors was on point. Uh, I, I always uh, like to hammer in the point that people are one of the biggest vulnerabilities uh, and tech, tech literacy and education is mm -hmm. a, a good way to address that. Yeah, absolutely. Yep. And uh, thanks, Fred. I saw you that you jumped on and you even turned your camera on. So uh, you get an extra gold star on that. <laughs> Didn't want to see, have you see me eating some chips. That's all. Oh. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it is about that time. So uh, yeah, yeah. Um, this is a, a really good approach. And uh, I think from security in the past, what I've noticed and I've joked about, I'm very guilty of it, is all oh, those damn users. If it weren't for those users, my life would be so much easier. But um, that's, a, that's a tough pill to swallow on the other side of the deck. And um, I don't know that I've had a lot of success making fun of the people that are doing stuff good naturedly in the, in the midst of their business. Um, I don't think I have to talk too much about how different times are these days. And everyone's just trying to get along. So, um, you know, they're doing what, they, what they're trying to do. And if you can have an agnostic approach that doesn't say, hey, you're vulnerable because of all these failures on what you're doing. But if you flip it on its head and you say, hey, you know what? Like, here's the things that you're in charge of. Here are the things that you could be doing. And here's where you're at. But you know what? There's some things that you could do to actually kind of help eliminate or reduce your own risk. Here's where everyone else is at. Here's things that you could probably do. I see a lot of CISOs, honestly, in the last year, 18 months, um, having that type of conversation with organizations. And it turns it into more of a carrot-based model, a gamification, if you will, where people start to understand, you know, all these things that we've been doing, to Kevin's point, about training people and all this stuff. It's always been very, um, you know, kind of over the top. Like, you must do this. I have these compliance things, and you need to do this. And um, God help you if you uh, if you don't do it or if you click on this link or whatever. And um, in the um, public sector, it's uh, there have been organizations that have actually taken up uh, and kind of resisted that. It becomes a union issue, frank, uh, frankly, because it's an obligation at time that type of stuff. Um, in the private sector, uh, particularly in more regulated enterprises like finance. Uh, they literally have like a, a two strike in your out policy. Um, multiple organizations have said, hey, you know, uh, you click on something once, um, you know, that's, that's, you know, shame on us. We're going to train you. It happens again. Shame on you. You're out of here. Um, so it's a completely different paradigm. But uh, I think the path to success, frankly, is right down that middle um, and making a person aware that what you can do actually matters. Um, and it's not just getting me off your back because I'm sending you the third mad note on doing this type of stuff, but there is some interesting things. And by the way, if you hadn't noticed, this all translates to you personally. Your own banking information is getting compromised. Your, uh, your credit cards that you've used online or you've used in person, this is happening to you. You have a financial benefit to this, right? Imposter identity is not a business thing. It's a personal thing. And I myself actually... Have suffered underneath that with uh, all these uh, COVID checks, uh, social security scam, unemployment thing. Um, you know, and I, you can imagine how diligent I am. It happens to everyone. So showing that we're on their side, showing them that hey, there's a way to approach this that takes them into consideration and helps lift them, is really something that works out a lot better in my experience. Hey Curtis, I think there's you know a, definitely an even an opportunity within education to get get the team uh, or to get people educated early on this. Uh, so, st you know, students are not immune to COVID related phishing schemes or even employment schemes, uh, you know, a financial aid schemes. So there's, you know, just, you know, from an education standpoint, it's never too early to get started on being more cyber aware. Absolutely. There was uh, a university, um, this was right before COVID, there was a lot of con uh, uh, concern about rolling out a security awareness program uh, to the students. Um, and uh, actually, again, it was one of those things where it went up to like the student board was involved in it and uh, they ended up rolling it out. And um, that CISO literally got a letter of thanks from a student 
uh, saying thank you uh, for doing this. I learned a lot on it. And, um, you know, we see the occasional dog sitting things, you know, that type of thing. And now I know what to do. And I've actually told my friends about it. That CISO has spent a long career in public sector. I had never gotten any communication other than <laughs> irate emails and phone calls from students. So it was, uh, it was, it was eye opening. Um, so that you know, th there's an opportunity here, um, and starting with people, I think, is the right way to do it. Hi, Curtis. Everyone, this is TJ uh, Watucky from uh, ASU's uh, Security Operations Center Director. I just wanted to uh, say thank you and um, uh, underscore that Proofpoint has been a big partner of ASU in protecting our assets and email for some time. Uh, we've gone through a, a bit of a journey and. Uh, starting with protecting our email, moving on to CASB and, and other tie-ins. And uh, just, it's been a great partnership. And uh, what you've highlighted with the people-centric approach to security, I just want to underscore that that is uh, where we're heading uh, at ESU. And it's um, we're it's a journey. We're certainly not at, the, at any end step there, but we're well mm -hmm. along the way in several aspects uh, and much to the, uh, the part of uh, your team and especially Laura and John uh, who are on this call. So I wanted to say thank you for uh, to Proofpoint for being a great uh, partner in that area and uh, continue, we work to continue to protect the ASU community. Thanks, TJ. Uh, yeah, it's been a great partnership. Um, was really pleased to see, uh, um, you know, the, the team really kind of embrace you guys. Uh, Laura and John have done a, a really good job um, I helped build out the uh, field public sector um, market for Proofpoint um, back, I guess this was five or six years ago. And I agree, um, our partnership with you has, has grown uh, greatly and it's benefited both sides. And that's, that's really the key here, right? You partner with your own people, we partner with you and uh, together the rising tide lifts all boats. Thank you very much for uh, the kind words, TJ. We're, we're honored to be able to share this with uh, the greater ASU community.